on radio and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Tonight on Piers Morgan Uncensored, Cristiano Ronaldo finally answers all his critics. I'll give my take on the explosive interview that's rocking the sporting world. Ronaldo says Manchester United have betrayed him and the club has made no progress in 13 years. Was he right to speak out to me now? I'll be joined live by football legend Graham Souness. Also tonight, peaceful protest or royal outrage or just a silly egg? I'll talk to the protester accused of throwing an egg at the king. And the heartbreaking story of Molly Russell, a teenage girl whose tragic suicide put social media on trial. Her father joins me live. Live from London, this is Piers Morgan Uncensored. Well, good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. It's the world-exclusive interview that's got the whole world talking, and I have a vested interest because I'm the one that did it. Days before the Football World Cup, football's biggest ever star has rocked the sporting world. We're running it. They're talking about it. You can see the entire interview. Interview to Piers Morgan. Just breaking in England, an exclusive interview between Piers Morgan and Cristiano Ronaldo. He's done this huge, high-profile interview. Mm. It's now gone outside of sport, football media, outside of sports media, and now is in mainstream news reports. Cristiano Ronaldo, who has said he is being betrayed by his club. The 37-year-old's comments were made during an interview with Piers Morgan for Talk TV. Ronaldo uh, releases the intro to an interview he has with Piers Morgan. You got on there on Twitter and you tweeted, Ronaldo, I don't respect the manager. Ronaldo, who uh, missed today because of illness, uh, but has also done an, e uh, an interview with Piers Morgan. Well, Cristiano Ronaldo has accused Manchester United of betraying him in an interview. There has been a huge reaction to this interview before it's even gone to air. And here are some of the papers uh, around the world, in fact, from America. We've had Australia. You've had, uh, of course, all around the UK, uh, Spain, Italy. I've had messages on Twitter from everyone, pretty much, uh, because he is, in the end, he's the biggest star that football's ever seen. Ronaldo has nearly half a billion followers on Instagram. Think about that. He'll pass that total probably sometime in the next week, far ahead of any other human being on the planet. You can see the entire interview. We've titled it 90 Minutes with Cristiano Ronaldo right here on Piers Morgan Uncensored on Wednesday and Thursday nights, a two-parter, both shows starting at 8 o'clock. It's one of the most explosive interviews, certainly, that I've ever done. Tens of millions of people have already viewed the two short clips we released last night, and there are more fireworks coming later this evening. Because when Ronaldo speaks, people listen. He's not just, in my view, the greatest footballer of all time. He's a global megastar. He's, of course, highly paid, too. And he's extremely commercially viable to any club. Sales of his shirts at Manchester United broke all records within 24 hours of him going back. And after a year in which many people, including some of his ex-teammates, have blamed him for the decline at Manchester United, he simply decided he'd had enough. They're trying to force you out. Yes, not only the coach, but the other two or three guys there around the club. At uh, the senior executive level? Yes, that I felt betrayed. And uh, you think they're trying to get rid of you? Honestly, I should not say that, I don't know, but listen, I, I don't care. I'm always, people should listen to the truth. Yes, I feel betrayed and I felt that some people that don't want me here, not only this year, but last year too. Well, already the interview's deeply divided opinion uh, amongst fans and wider football uh, supporters. The club has released a statement today saying it will consider its response when the full facts have been established, which I take to mean after they watched the whole interview. But Ronaldo makes clear throughout our conversation that he has the utmost respect for Manchester United's history as a club and for its supporters. He's as frustrated about the stagnation of the once biggest football team in the world as they are. That's why he's speaking out. Because as he sees it, the club hasn't moved forward at all since he left 13 years ago. I don't know what's going on, but since, since the, um, Sir Alex Ferguson left, I saw not evolution in the club. The progress was zero. For example, we have an interesting point that how the club as Manchester United after suck um, Ole, mm. they buy, they bring sport directive Ralph Regnick, which is something that nobody understands. 
this guy is, is not even a coach. A bigger club like Manchester United bring sport directive surprise not only me but all the world. You know, nothing changed. Surprisingly, not only the pool, the jacuzzi, even the gym, even some points, the technology, the kitchen, the chefs, <laughs> which is I appreciate, lovely, lovely persons. They stop in a in a time which is is it surprised me a lot. I thought I will see different things, different as I mentioned before, technology, infrastructure. But unfortunately, we see many things that I'm used to see when I was 20, 21, 23. So surprised me a lot. May surprise a lot of people. There are more home truths where that came from. And sometimes, let's be honest, the truth can hurt. Nothing was off limits in this interview. No tough, tough questions were pulled. Ronaldo answers them all with a brutal honesty, very seldom seen from a star of his renown. He also opens up about the family tragedy which befell him earlier this year, in which his partner lost one of the two twins that she was expecting. And he talks about the disrespect he feels that he's been shown by United's manager, Eric Ten Hag. He talks about the Glazers, United's unpopular American owners. And he talks honestly about criticism of him by his former colleagues in the old United dressing room. A lot's already been written and said about this interview, just based on the small amount we've already revealed. A lot of it, I have to say, is ill-informed bile. A lot of it is just plain fake news. The only way you'll find out what Ronaldo really says is by watching the whole interview here on Wednesday and Thursday. And I think you'll change a lot of people's minds when they do. Well, joining me now is the former professional footballer turned pundit, Graham Soonis, and chief football writer at The Times, Henry Winter. Well, welcome to both of you. So, Henry, uh, given that I've just spent uh, 10 minutes promoting my interview with Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, I think it's only fair to balance it out by saying that you've written a very excoriating column, as is your want sometimes when you disapprove of something, uh, about this today. You think it's a big mistake by Cristiano to do this. Why? Well, first, congratulations. It's a great scoop. Piers. Hi, Graham. Uh, I think I'm just reflecting the views of probably the majority of Manchester United fans that this legend of the game, as you say, certainly one of the greatest, probably top five players of all time, is slightly tarnishing his reputation in terms of, uh, in terms of how he's presented himself. I mean, he really should have left in the summer. I think there, from what I've read so far and what I've heard and seen in your clips, Piers, you know, there's, there are elements of him making pertinent points, particularly about the, uh, the lack of investment, it seems, in parts of Carrington and Old Trafford as well. So look, those are important things that he's saying there. And he is a statesman of the game and he should be listened to. So I think it's, you know, it's an important interview. But I just think the timing of it coming the day after uh, Manchester United had had a really gutsy win at Fulham. A young kid comes on, Garnacho is the future of the club. And I just think talking to fans, and I'm sure ex-players will, will echo this, is that you have to respect the manager. He's, and I think actually Ten Hag has been pretty respectful because anyone who's seen Ronaldo play this season, he's 37. He's played, I think, 520 minutes in the, uh, the Premier League. One goal, no assist. Look, he's been a fabulous player for Manchester United, Real Madrid, and clearly still with Portugal. But he's not the force that he was. And Ten Hag, new manager, new era. OK, before I go to Graham Souness, I just want to play a clip to both of you, which is a new clip from the interview, which I think may, may just give a little bit more insight into why Cristiano Ronaldo feels quite so disrespected by people that are running Manchester United right now. And I'll tell you the background to this. is There was a huge furore, as you know, Henry, about him not coming back to Manchester United in the pre-season when he should have done. A lot of speculation that it was to do with him wanting to leave the club and get away and everything else. In fact, as he reveals to me in the interview, it was because his little daughter, Bella, three months old at the time, who had survived this terrible tragedy in which uh, her twin brother had died, uh, she got bronchitis so bad that she was in hospital for a week. And he felt duty-bound as a father, and I'm sure we'd all understand this, to stay with her. I want to play the clip and then just see whether this perhaps slightly changes your mind. Let's watch the clip. You'd lost your baby son and now your baby daughter's in hospital. Exactly. And you must have been absolutely... I spoke with the directive of... and the president of uh, Manchester United and then kind of that didn't believe that something going wrong, which is, is make me feel bad. 
Really? Yes, I yes. I didn't believe you. They believe you, but in the same way, they are there. I never piece ever gonna change uh, the health of my family for a football. Never. Now or ten years uh, behind or forward, and it's something that really hurt me because they doubt of my words that I struggle, especially. Bell and Gio, we had one week in hospital because the Bell have a big problem. And I didn't go to the preseason because of that, because I didn't, I didn't, was allowed to let my family, if something happened, to do it the preseason because I think it wasn't not fair to let my family for a preseason. This is why I didn't go. Now, when he said that to me, Henry, I have to say I was pretty shocked. And obviously, I've not been able to put this to Manchester United. I don't know exactly who he you know, spoke to who didn't believe him. But the whole concept that anyone at senior level at Manchester United doubted Cristiano Ronaldo's word about his three-month-old baby, given what had happened to his family three months before, I find pretty shocking, actually. And it's unsurprising to me that that led to the breakdown in the relationship. There were clearly two narratives going on in pre-season. One of them was uh, Cristiano, who is very emotionally articulated there, and anyone with any children will absolutely empathise with him and his support for his partner and for his children and for his daughter. I think everyone totally understands that. And if Manchester United had not shown him the, the, the warmth the love that he was expecting, then, you know, clearly they were wrong in that. My experience of Manchester United and, and the staff at Carrington and at Old Trafford, football and otherwise, is that actually it's not a cold club. It's actually a pretty warm club. There's a lot of good people there who will look out for a player like Cristiano, who obviously many of them got to know when he was a kid himself at uh, 18. Mm. The other narrative, of course, was always the debate about his future and whether he should actually continue with a manager like Ten Hag. So I think really he should have gone in the summer anyway. But clearly everyone has sympathy for you know, the family predicament he had at the time. OK, let me bring Graham in. Graham, you've been a, one of the great players this country has ever seen, a, a terrific manager as well. You've been on both sides of of mm -hmm. this fence. And I listened to you this morning on TalkSport, very interesting stories you were telling about your time at Liverpool and when similar things had happened to you and how you reacted and felt. What do you make of, of all this? Was Cristiano Ronaldo entitled to come out and have this say in this interview with me? Well, that revelation that we've just, we've just watched, United will come out and deny it. They have to. They've mm -hmm. not shown compassion at such a terrible time for... Not believing him. Ronaldo his daughter his, was in hospital. Ronaldo, they have to come out and deny that. I mean, my take on that, whenever I was um, managing, I would leave it entirely up to the individual if, if they were having a, if their family were having a baby, if, he's, if their wives were having a baby. Um, so I'd leave it until you take as much time as you need, or if there's an illness in the family, take as much time as you need, we'll see you when, when we see you. So I'm sure United will come out and deny that. They will have another side to that story. Um, I, I, I get Ronaldo's argument. I, um, I think... As much as people think they shouldn't cut him some slack, Ronaldo has a standing in the game which is quite unique. There is, is he the best player that's been? There's a real argument for him. I mean, I personally think it's him or Messi. Mm. His stats would suggest it's him. The fact he's done it in different leagues yeah. would um, go in his favour as well. Um, but there's no doubt about it. He can sit in the room with anyone that's ever played football mm. and say, you know what, I think I'm the best that's ever played. Mm. There's a real argument for and that. And does that give you... No, no it, it doesn't. I know what you're going to say. Does it, it give you any special entitlement? I think it has to. I think it has to. I think Ronaldo still has so, he still has so much to offer, not just in the playing sense, but what mm. he gives you in the dressing room. I consistently say, Pierce, that you have no chance of being successful unless you have good senior pros. Right. He's a consummate. He also, is, he, he's, he is, he he's is still the best. It seemed to me, I sat with him for nearly two hours, he's still got this hunger burning inside him to win mm. more big trophies, to break more records, to be more successful. And what he really craves is an environment around him that can enable all that to happen. Mm -hmm. And he feels he just hasn't got that at United. And a lot of it, he said, is down to poor structure and management of the club. But he's spot on. I mean, this is not... Whenever I talk about United, the United supporters are up in arms. What do you expect from someone who played and managed Liverpool? Mm -hmm. I think United have been mismanaged further up the tree. Mm -hmm. I think they've consistently got the football decisions wrong. And that's why they find themselves in this dilemma. I think... Um, Getting back to Ronaldo, I think Ronaldo, when he came along, I was all for it. And I, for when me, he came back? Yeah, when he came back. I mean, 
There was nobody in that dressing room. There was nobody in that dressing room that younger players would look up to and say, mm. I want to be like him in 10 years' time. He was, the, he was the ultimate pro you could have gotten to correct that. 18 goals last year in the Premier League. Mm. I think it was that one more than one Harry. One more than Harry Kane. Yeah, that, that in itself. So you, he is that good, that special. You come up with a system to suit him. What I believe has happened, this is my belief. Mm. So without venturing into what we just witnessed with, with the, you know, these, these tragedies and the baby dying and then the, the other baby becoming ill, um, that you'd have to come some slack. But I'm sure there's... United will have a different story. But I believe when he says he wants to leave, there was a meeting at the start of the season, there was a meeting that would have taken place between the manager and Cristiano. After that meeting, they've both left the room with an understanding mm. that it's going to work. United start the season losing to Brighton and then losing to Brentford mm. badly. I think at that moment, I think the manager and the coaching staff thought, we cannot go down the road of using Ronaldo. There was a feeling that maybe he couldn't do the hard yards. So from that point on, I think Cristiano would have realised that he's been around the block many, many times. Mm. Um, so basically, Ronaldo will feel right now that he's been told a story. Mm. Someone has not, not kept a word, which is the manager. And I, I don't think... know if you've ever had a moment, Graham, and I, I had a moment rather famously last year Did when you... I had a little falling out with my employers, and I felt I was being disrespected by people I work with, and I did this. And I, to be honest, don't regret doing that at all. Um, so I kind of get... Uh, let me go back to Henry for a moment. I kind of get that if you feel... If you're Ronaldo, one of the great players to ever play the game, and you feel disrespected professionally in terms of what is happening on the pitch and the way you're being used, being benched, being dropped, being publicly scolded, you know, the mixed messaging of uh, Ten Hag not bringing him on against Manchester City uh, when they got a thumping uh, and saying he did it out of respect for Ronaldo and then literally a week later trying to bring him on with three minutes left when they're winning 2-0 against Tottenham, apparently showing the complete opposite attitude. If you, if you feel there's been this build-up of all this kind of disrespectful stuff towards you... And you have in the background this awful personal stuff going on as well. And you feel that the club has even doubted your word about some of that. I can see how we've reached this point where he feels enough and has come out all guns blazing. The truth in football is always out there on the pitch. And Graham, as a, as a former manager and a former player, I mean, he makes a very pertinent point that uh, Ten Hag, the new coach, clearly felt that uh, Ronaldo couldn't put in, to, to use Graham's phrase, very apt phrase, he couldn't put in the hard yards on the pitch. And the Premier League, particularly, is such a gruelling assignment now. It's just all about stamina, it's all about pressing, and with respect to one of the greatest players who's ever played, Ronaldo at 37 wasn't going to be doing the, uh, the, the pressing that was required. He's obviously he's clearly a superior player to Rashford, but Rashford would run himself into the ground for the team. So I think, look, there are other issues there. I think not coming off the bench when he was asked to. I mean, Graham's been in the dressing room. I don't know how Graham would have reacted if any of his Liverpool players had refused to, to come off the bench. And then going down the tunnel and this element that it's all about me, when in fact... Well, he does, he does say to me... Yeah, I mean, look, he absolutely does... Absolutely embodied in his... Liverpool teams that it's all about it should all be about the team yeah I, look, I do think Ronaldo's about the team but I think he believes also his the own fans. Yeah, I do think Ronaldo he believes his own personal goals and excellence as a footballer helps the team he thinks the two go hand in hand he did say to me he did apologise to all his teammates and shouldn't have done what he did at Tottenham but he also Graham he also said that he just felt this ongoing disrespect from his coach both about personal stuff and professional and he just said it, it just it boiled over. Well, I think it's down to him not him changing his mind from the two. This is what I believe: the mm. two losses, Brentford and Brighton. And then he, at that point, he has to sit down with him again and say, "Look, this is what I'm thinking." I think uh, it, it just boils down to, and it's to his credit that Ronaldo wants to play every minute of every game. Right. He still sees himself as a as a winner. He he will be a realist as well. He'll realise he can't do. The running down the channels. He actually admits he that. He admits that in the interview. He's, he's, he's not the player he was, but he thinks no. he's, a, he's a smarter player than and, he used to be. And Henry, Henry references Rashford. Th there's no comparison. Mm. You know, because your stats say that you ran whatever kilometres or how, how many miles, it's, 
it's the end product. The hardest thing in football is to score goals. Mm. He does that better than anyone that United has. I mean, I, I, if I'd been managing him, I, I, I think you have to come up with a... United are not in a place right now where they want to be. That's the politest thing I can say. Well, they're fifth and in the league. They're they, 13 points off take, the top. Take they're in the playoffs for the Europa League. I mean, this is not a place United are used to being, t- right? Take, take 18 goals out of United seasons last year. They could have been where, in the relegation Where did they finish? Yeah. There is still, there's still room for United... Sorry, for Ronaldo at United. And, and I think this whole saga has been... It's, it's been handled so badly, it was, it was avoidable. Um, I think with better communication, with people telling the truth, mm. and, and I think that's where Ronaldo's beef is. I think he's been told an untruth. Can he stay there now? I United? don't think he can. I think all the bridges are burnt now. Henry, is there any way back for Cristiano, even if he wanted to come back? No chance. And particularly the timing of your your very good interview, Piers. The timing of it shortly after the final Premier League game of the first half of the season. There's no way Ronaldo could have, your interview could have gone out a week ago because if he'd had to step out in front of the Manchester United fans, fans who for so many years sang Viva Ronaldo, he would have very sadly have got a different reception. And well, he I might, think but he of course, it, his if Portugal had a good run in the, the World Cup, and Ronaldo, United fans. Right, but if Portugal have a good run in the World Cup, they've got a good team, and Ronaldo starts banging in goals in the World Cup. Well, I mean, in the end, great players hold a lot of power. Well, fantastic. You see, we're, we're obsessed. That's fantastic, with... but he's 37. He's not the player he was. Right, final he's word. Still got a lot, he's still got a lot to offer, Henry. You know, if you go back to Aguero at, at City where he wouldn't be deemed to have been the best at doing the hard yards, the closing down, the unwanted stuff. Strikers don't really enjoy it. He would get away with it. Mm. You, United should have looked but, at the situation. But Manchester drop. United have got a new manager and a new era, and Ten Hag was always but, going to be Manchester United's yeah, but I'm, future. I'm saying we're, we're um, obsessed. Ronaldo with, was very much their past, and he should have gone in the summer. We're obsessed. This, this whole situation has been handed, handled very badly by United, in my opinion. He is a player he should have kept on side. He is a player that still has something. Ronaldo. He is a player that's something that he is still, a, I think, a hell of a lot to offer a football club. For mm. me, they've just they've, they've handled it very poorly. How do you how do you, how do you think it was going to end when you're upsetting a player of his standing? I think that's the we're bottom line. Yeah. We're talking about this instead of United on the front foot moving forward, winning a difficult game. I, on, I also weekend. think. I also think to be fair to Cristiano. You've got to watch the whole interview. All, we, all people have seen so far are a few clips, literally. That's like two or three clips. It's, it's a long 90-minute-plus interview we're going to air over two days. If you watch it all and you come to the same conclusion Henry has, fair enough. Uh, but I think a lot more people will feel sympathetic towards Ronaldo by the end of it than they might be feeling at the moment. I've got to leave it there. Henry, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Graham, great to have you on Pleasure. the show. Pleasure. Thanks for coming in. Really Cheers, appreciate Henry. it. We're coming next. Accused of hurling an egg at the king, Patrick Thelwell says his arrest was the most rewarding experience of his life, which just suggests to me he's had a very, very strange life. We'll talk to him live. Lee Russell took her own life after viewing online content about self-harm. Molly's father, Ian, says that the delays to a bill supposed to crack down on harmful content could cost young lives. He's calling on the government to get their act together. He'll be with me next. Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. See you tomorrow morning. Love you was the last thing that Ian Russell said to his daughter, Molly. Molly was 14 when she took her own life. She was suffering from depression and had been reading posts about self-harm online. In September, a coroner ruled social media had contributed more than minimally to her death. And her father described the content that Molly viewed as demented and life-sucking and believes that she hadn't seen those posts she might still be alive today. And Ian Russell joins me now. Ian, thank you so much for coming in. I've written about this. I've invest a lot of time researching this. And as a father of a young girl myself, Mm. my heart absolutely goes out to you for what you and your family have had to endure here. And I'm so grateful to you for now campaigning to try and stop it happening to other young girls because this is a deadly rabbit warren, Mm. the internet, and in particular, 
these social media sites like Instagram and Pinterest, which I know Molly was using regularly, because these algorithms drive this darker and darker material into their impressionable young minds to, as we see, deadly conclusion. That's absolutely true. We couldn't work out what happened to Molly, why that happened to Molly. She was such a positive, forward-looking girl. Um, it was a mystery to us. So it wasn't long before we started to look into her social media accounts and what we found there shocked us, horrified This was us. after she died? She died. We looked at some of the posts that she'd seen and saved and liked. And what kind of thing was it? For people who don't know about this Well, that's case. the problem t in terms of telling this story is on broadcast channels like this, you're not allowed to, to, to show those. So isn't that extraordinary? So I, we couldn't show this stuff because it's deemed to be so damaging. And yet social media, up it goes all the time and is deliberately targeted through the, uh, these algorithms, right? So there was research that Samaritans published last week. Um, they did some research in conjunction with the University of Swansea. Over three quarters of um, young teenagers said that they'd seen um, um, self-harm content online by the time they were 14. That's three quarters of young I mean, people. That's absolutely that. shocking. And um, what's worse is 83% of those people said that they didn't search for that content. It was the platform's algorithms that pushed that content towards them. When you discovered all this stuff after Molly died, and clearly you then got the answers to all of the questions that you must have been asking yourself, is that like, how could this possibly have happened to our girl? And yet there it is, clear. Mm. This is what happened to her. Her brain was almost sort of deranged by this filth that was coming down the line from these social media companies. You then decided, right, I'm going to try and be active in, in getting something done. Tell me about what it is that you're specifically trying to do. It's really to raise awareness, to make change happen, because the, the, the tech bosses at these platforms have had, a, had, had it easy. Up until now, they've had it easy. Their companies have been growing until this... Year, making a fortune. Then, making billions of pounds in profits. And their whole aim has been to, to keep those profits going as best possible and keep people on their platforms. And they prioritised profits, and they haven't designed safety into those products or given much... Um, thought about how their users should be safe online. The game-changing moment came when this coroner actually directly linked Molly's death to what the, the social media content. Mm. Not exclusively, but certainly said it was a big contributory factor. Has there been any kind of sea change since this verdict that you've identified? Um, no. The coroner also issued a prevention of future deaths report which means he's given the platforms, and the government for that matter, 56 days to come back and say what they're going to do in order to try and stop such deaths occurring again. Have any of these platforms contacted you personally? Um, there's been very limited content, uh, contact mm. while the inquest has been going on, but we, we'll see what happens when they, when they come back at the end of that 56-day period, 8th of December, they've got until to come up with some ways of making their, their platforms safer, particularly for young children. What is happening with the online harms bill, which we've read a lot about, but seems to be like almost everything in the government <laughs> at the moment because of the chaos sort of stuck in limbo land. Is there any real movement with it? So the online safety bill, is it's, it's, it's safety now bill. called, it was called the online harms bill, yeah. but it's, it's called the online safety bill, um, should have had its third reading in the Commons in July, which means it would be in the Lords now, being scrutinised by peers, uh, and then it, could, it could, uh, would go on to become law and Ofcom are standing in the wings, ready to be the regulator. But uh, that didn't happen because of the political turmoil, and it, it was then to have its third reading on the 1st of November. Same thing happened again. And along with lots of other bits of governmental uh, legislation and, and uh, um, procedures that happen in Parliament, it's, it's stopped. Mm. But there does seem to be um, a commitment. I had a, a text today from the Culture Secretary, Michelle Donnellan, mm. um, saying, know that the online safety bill has dragged. Just wanted to reassure you that both I and the Prime Minister are personally committed to getting it completed this session. That you got that personally today? From, from Michelle Dolan. Yes. What, did, what did you feel when you read that? Well, that's good, because nothing's going to happen, because uh, the, the, the tech platforms have been self-regulating and that hasn't been good enough, so nothing's going to happen until governments regulate. That's the first step. But the, the proof of the pudding is what's in that bill, because... What do you want to see in it? The, 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 what has to happen is that things that are illegal 
mm. in the offline world, in our world, are also clearly illegal and, and controllable, yeah. uh, and, the, and the regulator can do something about it in the, in the online world. But also, the stuff that Molly did see, and I can quote an example. She saw, um, for example, a little cartoon drawing of a sad-looking look girl that simply said, who would love a suicidal girl? Now, that on its own isn't too harmful, maybe, isn't too dangerous, but when you're seeing posts like that in the hundreds or maybe even thousands... I think it is dangerous. Even well, what you've just told me shocks me. The idea that a young girl can be viewing that kind of thing when their brains aren't really fully formed, they're not properly... 14 is a, is a tough time for yes, teenagers. Yes, extremely tough time. It's a time. really tough time. And that content was pushed to Molly by the algorithms. Yeah. And so that content, which is harmful, but may be considered to be legal, also has to be uh, regulated against. Because if, if the regulator doesn't have the powers to remove that content, then sadly, there may be more tragedies like Molly's. What can parents who are watching this and sh share the horror I'm probably I, I'm feeling about this, what can they do to better protect their kids in the meantime? That's a really difficult tightrope to walk. You've basically got to keep a dialogue going, I think, mm. between you and your children. It's really hard to do that. Um, if you push too hard, they can find ways to show you the fluffy toys and the celebrities whilst on another account, maybe, having the content that they don't want you to see. In fact, for example, we all followed each other as a family on Twitter. Molly didn't seem to be a social media person. She deleted her Twitter account because she didn't use it. What we didn't know until the inquest was she'd set up a secret right. Twitter account. So it's a very difficult balancing act. But all I would say is keep that dialogue going. Talk about the problems that you might mm. find online and encourage people, uh, young, young people in your family, to tell their parents about it. Funny, tell me about Molly, just quickly, what kind of girl she was. She was the most gorgeous of girls, one of the most caring individuals uh, I've ever known. She loved helping others. She loved um, making people laugh as well. She had a, a keen sense of humour. And um, whatever she would have done with her life, uh, we have no doubt that it would have been fascinating and amazing. And sadly, we'll never know what that would have been. I'm so sorry for your loss for you and your family. I can't think of anything worse than the way that she was almost steered to her death by social media platforms is an absolute disgrace. And we'll certainly do whatever we can on this show to, to keep this in the limelight until proper definitive action is done to protect other girls. Thank you, Piers. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Well, still to come, he's accused of throwing an egg at the new king. And he says he's been banned from carrying eggs in public and he's smirking away in our camera tonight. Patrick Thelwell will be here live after the break. And a reaction to the man who puts the cock into Hancock. But could he actually end up winning people around? We'll debate that after the break as well. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Joining me and now is tonight's superstar pack, Talk TV contributor Emily Sheffield, political journalist Ava Santina, associate editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire, who I last saw this morning on Good Morning Britain. Actually, looking at clips of me and Matt Hancock. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Which was quite entertaining, because it was all about this... I mean, obviously, the, the, the cock in Hancock continues. Um, it was quite interesting. They were debating the fact that in I'm a Celebrity, he talked about how he avoided answering questions. I think we've got a clip of this. The pivot. In, in politics, it's called the pivot. And you... <gasps> right? This it's is pivot. This so house. you have to... You, no, have to, you have to... Uh, you have to... You have to... Give enough link to the question that it doesn't look like you're avoiding the question whilst pivoting. And a good pivot is admirable. That just confirms everything I've always thought about this slippery toad. So this is a Good Morning Britain this morning actually brought me back from the dead to show exactly <laughs> what, they, what he means by the pivot. Watch this. My question to you is, will you be taking a pay cut as you urge footballers to do and as the government in New Zealand is doing? Yes or no? Well, I, I'm not proposing to do that. What I am proposing to do is work every hour that there is. Do you support the boycott? Did you agree with it? Well, I'm, I'm here to answer all of the questions that you might have on behalf of your viewers. I, 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 I just asked you one. Um, I was... Uh... 
I mean, what a slippery little toad of the type that's running after him in the Australian bush. I'm sorry to keep harping on about this, but I don't get the joke with Hancock. I don't think any of this is funny. No. I don't think him deserting his constituency, flying around the world, 400 grand in the back pocket in a cost of living crisis, trading off his infamy for horrendous handling of the, certainly the first wave of the pandemic, and then the scandal of him having to quit for breaking his own lockdown rules. What is funny about this? And why are these people in the jungle now high-fiving him and cheering? Let's take a look at last night. Well done. Do you know what it is, actually? Mm. What I'm really looking for is a bit of forgiveness. No way! Oh, yeah, Stop yeah. that scorpion. Are you serious? Oh, it's only small, it's only small. You OK? Oh, oh, OK. Oh. It hurts a lot. And I'm feeling slightly dizzy. It was a mistake, cos I fell in love with somebody and... We and I was taken happened. by love. Well, it's true. What I do... Uh, sorry, I'm oh. literally <laughs> puking. I'm puking. I can't watch any of it. I fell in love with... Oh, shut up, Hancock. Now, before we get to the, the superstar pack, I just want to make a revelation about tomorrow night's show. Is that because Matt Hancock has deserted his constituents, I'm going to take the show to his local pub, which is the Cock Inn. It's actually called the Cock Inn. It's in uh, West Suffolk. Uh, and we're going to take the whole show down there. I'm going to broadcast from inside the Cock Inn about the man who puts the cock into Hancock. And I'm actually going to have a lot of his constituents there who are absolutely raging with fury about him deserting them at this very difficult time. So tomorrow night, live from the Cock Inn uh, in, in uh, West Suffolk. We have got a picture, but we're rather like Hancock in the jungle. It's, uh, it's all gone to Helena Hancock trying to find it. Let me ask you, uh, Kevin. Let me ask you, Kevin. Why is this funny, any of this? Because when we go down tomorrow night, I can bet your life... A lot of these constituents will be raging about him. Oh, they will, and uh, deservedly so. Look, he gets 84 grand a year, and he's, uh, he's gone off to get a 400 grand paycheck and reinvent himself. There's nothing funny about it at all. He's an act. He's a fraud. That's what he is. And he, he's winning some of the other campers over because it's like, almost like the Stockholm Syndrome, being with your captors and you begin to like them. Right. I mean, but I'm worried about the health of the scorpion. Have you got any updates? Well, these poor animals <laughs> haven't <laughs> bite into his flesh, but it's, all, it's such a fake yeah, attempt. It is to rebuild his PR. And it's like, I don't, sorry, no, too soon. Where's the inquiry into the pandemic first? Yeah, I mean, if he cared even an inch, he'd be there at the forefront of the inquiry, properly apologising, laying out all of the evidence, what he did throughout the pandemic and really owning up to it. Going in here and eating some eyeballs is not going <laughs> not to change anyone's opinion at all. No, but also, there's a serious point. I mean, is it, I mean he is a paid... He's a paid member of parliament. He's only £85,000 a year to actually serve his country as a, an MP in his constituency. It shouldn't be left to me to go and hold his surgery in his constituency. I'm very happy to do it, and I'm sure it'll be very lively television, but this should not be happening. Well, I think it's very hard to defend uh, Matt Hancock at the moment, So, but I'm going to semi-try. Go on, have a go. So someone's got to. Is I think he's not... Uh, it was in recess, so he's probably at, at max going to miss 10 days in his constituency. He is online with them and talking to them. I think it's is more... He? No, he's not. Yes, he's he not. is. No, no, he no. had that agreement. No, tonight, that he could be. tonight, his constituency office has been sending back out of office saying, we'll come back to this later. That's oh, how the right. office he, he, he'd gone on he, he with the promise that he claimed... Like everything Hancock says, going to take you with a pinch of salt. Yeah. Yeah. That he claimed that he would be. I do think there is an opportunity. I think it, it, that he could... He is reaching a very large audience. Now, put aside the fact that we all probably agree this was, A, the money, B, a sort of career switch... There is a very real opportunity for him to talk to millions of viewers about political life and what happened during the pandemic and actually face up to the anger of people like Roy George in the camp. All he said so far no, is, I, it did is it for, being, I broke it lockdown being rules edited. for love. Yeah. For love. Well, yes, but fine. But then the campers, the campers, I think, could or could be giving him a lot harder time for it. No, that, all... that is what I find is quite surprising. Well, Kevin, I don't find it surprising. They've all, they've all eaten the jungle Kool-Aid, right? Yeah. Now they're all like, oh, he's a hero. Mm. He's putting his hand into a bowl of snakes and he's coming back with little stars. And I'm like, sorry, none of this is making me laugh. Yeah, but also... I remember what happened. You also hear Boy George and Mike Tyndall and Sue Cleaver, Sue Cleaver ex Corey yeah. plotting against him, others having some complaints. I think let's uh, see, how it, pan, see how it pans out. But it's all about him. 
He's not, he's not doing it for democracy or great understanding no. of politics, explaining Westminster. And he's certainly how not it doing works. it to raise awareness to oh. dyslexia, which he hasn't mentioned so far, from what well, I've seen. Well, unless that's been edited out, and I do think yeah. that's a shame. He's not. Well, you think he's about every that. hour on the hour mentioning dyslexia? Well, I, he doesn't have control about what goes out. Remember, so I do think it's a shame because uh, it, it, dyslexia is a really serious problem and leads to a lot of young kids. All right. Well, look, we're going to be down at the here. cock. Uh, in West Suffolk tomorrow. Which um, is a brilliant idea, my say. Thank you. The cock really. in. The cock in. <laughs> the, the appropriately named. <laughs> we have a little bit of voice over here. Right? Live from the cock in. <laughs> have we got a picture of the damn place yet? Bravo. Let's have a look at the picture. There's that. the cock in. There it is. We'll live be there live from, from the, the pub tomorrow night. In if you in live Suffolk. in. Uh, I think it's. Is it, where is it? In Suffolk? No, whereabouts? Little Little Thurlow in West Suffolk. That's the cock in. It's the famous pub where his mate ran the pub. Oh, it is that one. With the, the, and uh, he ended contract. up with this massive PPE yeah, contract. Yeah. The new owner is not such a friend mm -hmm. or such a fan. Hence, we're going to be in there. Um, find, uh, just talk quickly about Ronaldo. Obviously, I would say this. I've done the interview, but I think he's entitled to have his say. I um, think he's been pretty, pretty appallingly. And actually, anyone should be entitled to have their say. Yeah, I'm delighted he's had his say. Look, he's, he's one of the world's greatest footballers. And I'm sick and tired as a football fan. I'm, I'm, I'm a uh, you know, Sunderland fan. Mm. I've been told if a player's not playing or there's something, it's yeah. they're ill or they're it's injured. Yeah, and you know, you know, it's a lie. I mean, they, they've fallen out big time. He feels badly treated. Mm. Now, whether he was or not, you'd need the other side of the argument to decide. But he feels badly treated. I mean, Emily, the, the shocking thing is the new clip we played tonight. Where if this is true, and I don't doubt him at all, and in fact, it's ironic given what the clip is. That, that having lost his baby son, that three months later his baby girl who survived, they were twins, gets seriously ill with bronchitis, hospitalised for a week. He's worried sick, obviously, with his girlfriend Georgina. And so he decides to stay with the family rather than go on the pre-season friendly tour. And the club don't even believe him by his account. I mean, if, that is, if that's correct... Um, and I guess we need to hear the, the club mm. come back on this. Or even, I have to say, if they allowed Ronaldo to think that, mm. means they didn't handle it right. Yeah. He had lost a child that is three months later. This, 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 that kind of grief lasts a very long time. Yeah. And if you suddenly... When, when you lose one child, I can say from mm. some experience in my own family, is that you become very panicked about yes. the health of the others. Absolutely. Ava, any thoughts on Cristiano yeah, Ronaldo? No, I just think he came across as a really desperate man. I think it was really sad to watch. Yeah. It's, like, it's a difficult watch. I don't think he's desperate. I think he's very frustrated yes. by the yes. sequence of events on and off the pitch. And I certainly think, and I would because I do a show called Uncensored, he's allowed to have his opinion. Stay with me, Pat, because we're about to talk exclusively for his first television interview to the young man who threw an egg at new King Charles. And I'll ask him why he did it. There he is. Oh, yeah. Everyone's had their say about the world's most famous footballer. Now, it's his turn. Let me start by asking you, why are you doing this interview? I think it's the time to say something. 90 minutes with Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano! An exclusive that's rocked the sports world. Wednesday and Thursday nights at 8pm, only on Piers Morgan Uncensored. Well, he's accused of egging uh, King Charles while shouting this country was built on the blood of slaves. He's had death threats, but he says the arrest was the most rewarding and worthwhile experience of his life. And Patrick Thelwell joins me now. Uh, Mr Thelwell, thank you for joining me. Why did you throw an egg at King Charles? Uh, allegedly. Uh, it was allegedly. You did it, throw didn't you? an egg at the king. You did it, though, right? Sorry, Piers, I came on the show with the understanding that that you knew that I can't discuss the ins and outs. I know, mate, but I King did, Charles, but King Charles went on the walkabout in York on the understanding no idiot would throw an egg at him. So we've all I, been I let down, right? I was arrested. I was arrested. We've all been let down. You, you arrested because you threw Yeah, we've the been egg. let down by the monarchy, by the rulers of this country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The reason why I don't believe in the monarchy is because I think that all people are equal and therefore uh, I don't think anyone's blood is any more special than others. Uh, and we, we're living in a cost of living crisis at the moment where some people can't afford to heat. So why would you uh, waste an egg? Or to eat food and you've got why someone would you waste an egg? Well, it's... well, why are you laughing? You wasted you know an egg and it fed somebody. Day... Yeah. Why would you throw an so, egg at a 75-year-old man? Did you know that every man? day 
It's actually his birthday today. I think he's 76 today. Every right? day, the king uh? has five eggs boiled for him. He picks one that's the consistency he's right on, and then he throws away the other four. Oh, but this that is a man. Look, look to be serious for a moment. With look, us today. Pa Patrick, to be serious, this is a man who lost his mother several months ago, right? This is a man who's been... And several months ago, people said that no, you no, couldn't on. protest I, against I'm, the monarchy because now yet. wasn't the right time. Answer my question. Why would you think that, regardless of anything to do with the monarchy, why would you think it's a decent thing to do to a man who's still grieving the loss of his mother, the Queen, to just hurl eggs at him and his wife in the street? Why do you think that's a sensible thing to be doing? So... A couple of months ago, when the Queen died, people said that now is not the time to protest against the monarchy. Every protest that's happened in this country over the last couple of months, you, people like you, have disagreed with the methods, they've disagreed with the target, and I'm telling you now that there is no one who is a more worthy target uh, for people in this country who are angry at the poverty that they're being forced to live in whilst he gets to wear a crown of stolen jewels and live in a palace The than problem the is, though, mate, you, you protest at everything, don't you? You're a serial activist and protester. You've been arrested five times. You're There's always a lot of things it, that are you? wrong with the world. You're always... You're out there with your little, little leg bag and you're world. throwing them at everyone, right? <laughs> if you say so, Piers. I just think, honestly, I think you're a total dick. <laughs> OK. So, is swearing okay on this show or not? Because Absolutely, we're uncensored, but unfortunately, for... there's no time. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so, uh, that's Patrick Thelwell. <laughs> uh, he was about to obviously unleash the verbal version of his egg throwing. Um, chucking an egg at King Charles, it's pathetic, isn't it? Yeah, look, I, look, I'm a Republican. Uh, I'm a, you know, against the monarchy, but I, I just think it's, it's down. You see, respect. It's a, the man's well, 76 today. He's look, with his wife. It would have been a scary incident, it, right? It, it, He's still mour mourning his mother. For the love of God, it, just show the man some respect for his age. It, it, it doesn't mind anything else. It just doesn't win anyone your argument. No, I mean, that's not. it. As a Republican, I want argument. Ava, any defence for this idiot? Look, it's impossible to win uh, the argument with the monarchy. I'm not going to park, park the egg throwing because I'm not into the egg throwing. But he's, he has got a point. He does get five eggs boiled from every morning. He does live a life of luxury. And you're not allowed to doesn't say Doesn't everybody anything. get five eggs boiled from them in the morning? <laughs> Emily, are you defending in this yeah. imbecile? I'm not, because I, I, I don't really understand what his message is. I mean, all yeah. you just end up hearing is you hear about There's an no egg message. being He's a smirking a little wastrel. So, no, I, I, smirking I, wastrel, I, chucking eggs around at the cost of living crisis. You know, no truth, time for it. Truth is, if somebody hits him with a, an egg, he'll be whingy. We're well, talking of eggs. We'll be down at the Cock Inn uh, in West Suffolk tomorrow. Go down if you want to join the party. We'll be doing what Matt Hancock should be doing. That's it for tonight. Keep it uncensored. Good night.